So welcome everybody. Um, today's speaker is Jimmy Scott from Pittsburgh, and he's talking on fractional contact inequalities and applications. Please go ahead. Thanks so much, uh, Philip, and, and, and thank you very much for the for the invitation. Uh, is this so? I full screen this on my computer. Does it display as full screen for everybody else? It, it's okay. Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, as, as Philip said, we'll be talking about fractional uh, corn type inequalities and, uh, uh, and hopefully some applications. Um, and uh, so, so when I say fractional, um, uh, it refers to, to fractional sublift spaces. Of course, when people talk about fractional sublift spaces, they can mean a few different things. So uh, for the sake of, of, of the, the talk, it's, you know, it's, it's essential to define uh, uh, the fractional sublift spaces that I'm discussing are those that are defined uh, via the uh, Gagliardo uh, seminorm. Um, so, so for this talk, we're we're considering uh, s uh, to be uh, strictly less than than one, uh, and p is strictly between one and infinity. Um, and so that's the those are the the that's the range of parameters for which we'll be discussing uh, uh, these these inequalities. So, so this is this is the the space WSP um, with this norm, and so what we're interested in is, oops, is characterizing. Um, we're interested in characterizing uh, spaces of of vector fields. Um, so, so on a on a domain omega. Uh, so, so instead of scalar valued functions or real valued functions, uh, these will be functions whose domain and range is the same uh, is Euclidean space with the same dimension. Um, so, so uh, hence why uh, the notation, hence the bold face notation. Um, and so uh, the fractional sublift spaces are defined in the same way, right? It's uh, uh, you know, for, for vector fields. So for vector fields, each component uh, belongs to WSP omega with the same norm. And so what we'll do is we will characterize uh, these vector fields um, using uh, a quantity that is that is actually smaller than the Gagliardo seminorm, um, and so uh, so so what we have here is a is a relatively new uh, characterization of, of, of WSP, um, and so we define the space XSP to be almost exactly the same. Uh, so, and, and again, this is defined for vector fields from from uh, from R D to R D, or, or rather, omega being a subset of R D. So the dimension matches. Um, except the Gagliardo seminorm, instead of uh, being defined as the uh, difference u of x minus u of y, it's defined as this uh, what we call a projected difference. So you take the difference u of x minus u of y and project it onto the onto the unit vector x minus y over x minus y, integrating over all um, y and x. Um, and so this, this, this dot product makes sense because, uh, because the vector field u and, and the, 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 the uh, domain have the same dimension. Okay, so, so, <clears throat> so, so hence the, the scalar product is, is well-defined. And so what we'll do is for uh, several different classes of domains omega, we will, investigate to what extent the spaces WSP and XSP are equivalent. So uh, this will depend on, on the range of S and P. This will depend on the smoothness of omega and it will also depend on, on uh, uh, conditions, some, some different constraints on the functions, which we'll explore for, for each of the different classes. <clears throat> okay, so, so the first case that we'll consider is, is omega being equal to to, uh, to all of Euclidean space. Uh, and then the, the second case will be, will be a, a smooth bounded domain and there will be some, some uh, caveats there. And then finally, we'll talk about an application. So, uh, so, so in the case that omega is all of Euclidean space, we can show that these two spaces are actually the same. Uh, that is the semi-norms uh, the Gagliardo seminorm, and then this projected difference quotient will be equivalent. Um, and so, so obviously, uh, one inequality is easy by by consistency of, of norms and in, in, in the definition of the dot product, uh, but the other inequality is 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 the non-trivial one, and that inequality is what we call a fractional corn type inequality. 
And so, so, so that's so that's the the name that we that we give it. And so the result is is for for p strictly between one and infinity, and s between zero and one, there exists some constant independent of u, so that uh, so that this inequality holds um, so long as as uh, the norm of u, so long as is is this side is finite. I mean, if it's if so, I've written u and lp. So if this side is infinite, then it's obviously trivial. Um, but whenever this, but in other words, the Gagliotta Semin norm is finite whenever this uh, uh, difference quotient, th this semi norm characterized by this different, this projected difference quotient is finite. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, okay. But before I, I, I discuss this, this inequality further, I should explain why, uh, why we care at all. Um, you know, okay, maybe you know there's, there's a new characterization. It's sort of interesting. Uh, you know, it looks, you know, maybe it's aesthetically interesting, but but there's actually some 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 motivation behind this, um, and that and that comes from 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 the classical uh, uh, theory of of of, uh, of elasticity and continuum mechanics and the classical Korn's inequality. So so in the classical Korn's inequality, if you have a function from R d to R d, you can always write its gradient. As it's it's d by d gradient matrix as the symmetric part plus the skew symmetric part. That's just true for any matrix. Um, but what Korn's inequality says is that, in the sense of averages, you can control the gradient of u just by the gradient of its symmetric symmetric part. Okay, I say average because the LP norm is is, is in some sense you know uh, uh, looking at averages, but. Um, so, so this inequality certainly does not hold in the uniform sense. It does not hold in L infinity. But for LP, uh, so long as P is, is between, strictly between one and infinity, this, this inequality holds. Um, so, so in other words, uh, to control every single uh, uh, derivative in the D by D uh, gradient, you only need these uh, D times D minus one over two quantities that are contained in the symmetric part of the gradient. Um, and so Korn's inequality it was proven by, or it was, it was first investigated by, by Korn in, uh, uh, in around 1908. Uh, and it's, you know, since, you know, it's, it's gotten several proofs. And, and the first thing that it was used to do is, is, is to prove uh, uh, coercivity in W12 of a, of an, of a linear elastic energy, right? So, so this is a, so this is a, an energy that appears uh, as the result of this is a stored energy of a uh, of an elastic solid that satisfies some linear elastic relation, um, and it is a it's a bilinear form that depends not on the gradient of u but on the symmetric part of the gradient. All right, a here is a fourth order tensor, um, and then these two things are matrices, so it gives you gives you a scalar. Um, and so so uh, so the thing is is that because you have uh, so, so this gives you coercivity in, in L2 of, of uh, or, sorry, in W12 of, of this energy that follows from Korn's inequality. Okay. So um, there seems and, to be a question. Oh, uh, yes. yes. Yeah, just quickly. So what's known about the sharp constant there? Oh, the, the, oh, oh, like the sharpness of this constant? Yeah, yeah. What's known about the, uh, the sharpness of that constant and also about attainment? So... Yeah, for that. So, so and you're talking about in this this case yeah. when we're still talking about gradients. Um, so uh, I don't know very much. Um, what I do know is that the the optimal Korn's constant is 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 related to uh, problems of buckling. So like if you have some kind of thin, you know, uh, 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 solid, and there's some sort of tremendous load subjecting on either side, uh, you know, the 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 extent of that load before the material fails is somehow related to that. Uh, to the to the to the optimal constant in Korn's inequality. Why or how? I don't know, <laughs> um, but I do know I do know that there that, that that's a very relevant question in, in mechanics. Um, and so I, I think I think like Yuri Grabowski has investigated this to some extent, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Temple. Um, but but in terms of, of how it's attained, like you know, for what functions it attains and things like this, uh, you know, and the conditions on the yeah, thanks. On the just, just, yeah. just curious. Thanks. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so the so in the non-local case, the the sublift characterization is uh, is similarly motivated. 
um, uh, in other words, it's it's motivated by by a model of continuum mechanics uh, that is that is non-local. Uh, so, so this this model is referred to as as paradynamics, um, introduced by by Stuart Sealing in in 2001. Um, this is a this is a model that that was originally designed to capture uh, uh, singular behavior. So so whether it be a, a fracture or or damage in materials or or some kind of of, of singularity that for, for which a classical derivative or even a weak derivative is not defined, uh, uh, that this model was was designed to try and capture that that behavior. Um, and so so and and the reason it, it you know the reason it it, you know, you, how do I say this? Um, it, the normal model doesn't make use of gradients, of spatial gradients at all. At all. So that's that's sort of why why uh, you know why it might be might be useful. Um, and so so there's been a lot of work done on on both on the theory and then the implementation of paradynamics for a variety of of, of mechanics problems. Um, but but one class of problems that sort of comes the motivation from paradynamics is, is minimizing this this energy um, where where you have the the Poisson data or the external load uh, F prescribed uh, and then you have this this energy here this non-local energy which is uh, which exactly has the the projected difference quotient uh, contained uh, contained in the in the in the in the vertical order. Um, so, so this is this is somewhat motivated by the so so if p is equal to two, you can compare this to the to the classical linear elastic energy, or at least the you know its character is is similar in the sense that uh, uh, that you have that you have somehow you know a quadratic energy depending on this projected difference quotient, whereas here you have a quadratic energy depending on the symmetric part of the gradient. But now the thing is, is that why is the why is this projected difference quotient connected in any way to something like the symmetric part of the gradient? That is, why would we call this a fractional corn type inequality? Well, this, this object, uh, uh, you know, you can see the symmetric part of the gradient emerge in, in Taylor expansion. So of course you have X minus U of Y, uh, you know, first order, that's the, that's the gradient. But if you Taylor expand U and then, and then take the scalar product with X minus Y, you can symmetrize that the resulting quadratic form, um, and so in that sense, uh, you know, in this in this sense, the the symmetric part of the gradient uh, sort of appears on this side. So this is somehow a, a non-local analog for 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 that quantity, um, and so this is also why we why ex why we expect it to be true. In the local case, we know that we can control the gradient by the symmetric part of the gradient, an LP norm. So we hope that something is true for for the uh, uh, for for the fractional subnet spaces defined by the Gagliardi semi um, with with the with the analogous application in mind. That is proving some kind of stability uh, for the uh, 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 for this one for this energy. Okay, <clears throat> so so to show the equivalence. Um, again, this is the, this is the statement of, of equivalence here, um, and let's see. So there's a the implicit constant here is, is of course independent of u, um, and so so the the so so we're interested in, in in proving this for so so for p equals two in the quadratic case, um, one can use the Fourier transform to see uh, the equivalence of, of Fourier multipliers. And that's not that's not so hard to do. But we were interested also in Sobolev embedding results. Um, we're interested in in the, the sort of calculus that you get in in the local sublet spaces, and we're interested in in the same thing uh, uh, for for the fractional sublet space. Um, and so we'd like to see that uh, that the energies that come from paradynamics somehow satisfy the same relations between S and P as as, as you know they, they inherit all of those relations from from the classical sublet spaces, about which much more is known. <clears throat> Um, so, so for p equals two, one can use the Fourier transform, but, but for p not equal to two, um, there's there's no there's no Fourier multipliers. Um, you know, this isn't this isn't defined by a, by by the LP norm of a symbol convolved with you know some sort of convolution type operator with u. It's not defined that way. Um, there's no there's no matrix entries, um, and so so that was sort of the 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 task that was that was set before us. And so what we do is we turn to alternative characterizations of of sublet spaces. Um, when they're defined over over all of Rd. 
Um, so the, the fractional simple spaces are, are examples of, of, uh, of Bessoff spaces. They're a special case. Um, and there are many uh, different characterizations. Uh, one could say countably many different ones. Um, you know, if you had to do an exhaustive search of the literature, I guess you could say definitively whether or not they're finite. But anyway, so, so uh, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple monographs writ written about, about Bessoff spaces and, and of course, uh, Tribal Azorkin spaces. Um, and so, so one such characterization uses uh, the, the harmonic extension or, or, or the approximation to the identity using the Poisson interval. Um, and so, so you can characterize Bessoff spaces using, using this harmonic extension. Um, so, so the idea here is, is this Poisson kernel is, is the solution to the Laplace equation on an upper half space. Uh, it attains, uh, you know, uh, P convolved with F attains F, you know, attains the boundary values um, in LP and almost everywhere. Um, um, there's also, you have maximal function estimates, you also have non-tangential estimates, things, things like this. So, so the, the solution of the Laplace equation on the upper half space is, is well-defined via these, via these potentials. Okay, so what's the, what's the connection to, to Bessoff spaces or to fractional subleaf spaces? So the, the result is that if you, uh, if you consider the T derivative of the, of the harmonic extension multiplied by T raised to some weight, um, and then, and then uh, uh, integrate from integrate over this measure from zero to infinity. Um, this turns out to be the same space as as the the fractional sublip space, um, and you have the of course the equivalence of of the semi norms. Um, and so this is proved by by Mitchell Tableson uh, in the in the sixties, and it can be found in 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 chapter five of Stein's Singular Integrals book. Um, and so so our idea was was okay. Well, well so there's a Poisson integral here. Um, that somehow solves, you know, that somehow harmonic in the upper half space. So, so our idea was, was uh, let's try to find a, a different approximation to the identity that somehow incorporates, instead of the full difference quotient, the projected difference quotient instead. Um, so that's, that's sort of the main, the main idea. And so, so the idea is, is you, you translate the, the equivalence of, 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 uh, of these two Bessoff, you know, one is a Bessoff space, the other one is a sort of type Bessoff space. You translate the question of equivalence from that characterization into a characterization involving approximations to the identity. So our idea was was instead of uh, so so the the space K is the one defined by the uh, by the Poisson integral, and so our idea was let's find a space uh, defined in exactly the same way except it uses a different approximation to the identity that's somehow defined on the upper half space. So instead of the the, the Poisson integral, you use something, some other function, p, uh, the script p, um, defined exactly the same way, so that uh, you can you can show you know somehow that it's equivalent to uh, still this this uh, you know you, you know you first show that it's equivalent to the to the Poisson integral characterization of the of the of the best off space, um, and then you'd also like to show that this is somehow an alternative characterization of the original. Uh, projected difference quotient, right? So, so the interest is we want this equivalence. This one's already known. And so then we'd like to take the long way around the square by filling in with this function spaces. Um, and so and the thing is, we don't even need the equivalence. We really only need these inclusions so that, um, um, so that, so that this inequality holds, right? Originally, we're trying to prove that the WSP norm is controlled by the uh, uh, the projected difference quotient semi-norm space. Um, and so, so really all we need are these inclusions, uh, the inclusions one and two. Um, so that'll be the, the proof that, that I show y'all is, is, is how, how exactly that, uh, that follows. Um, so, uh, so, so, but first of all, of course, we need to choose, you know, what the suitable function uh, script P actually is. In order to even have a hope of, of, of getting you know these two these two inclusions, um, so and so what we do is 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 we were able to so, so we were able to do that um, we were able to find a, a function script p that that indeed satisfies these two inclusions um, except now it's it's not a a, a scalar valued function uh, it's actually a, a matrix it's a matrix valued function. Um, and so, so this is this doesn't uh, uh, you know, 
of this. So, th so this actually comes from, from uh, Poisson kernels that are associated to solving the equations of linear elasticity, actually the, uh, the uh, uh, Lemay-Navier equations of elasticity. Um, so so this, this, this kernel was, was motivated by, by the work of Jose Maria Martel and then Darina, uh, Irena and Marius Matreya. Uh, there's, there's a sequence of, of papers in, in 2013 that they wrote on, on solving uh, elliptic systems on, on the upper half space. And so that's, that's where this uh, is, that's, that's, what, that's what this is motivated by. Um, and so then you can define a, a Poisson type integral uh, in that case, uh, where, where you define uh, the convolution of, of a matrix and a, and, and a vector um, in the same way that you would define matrix multiplication. Um, and so, so again, this is, this is, uh, so this is of course, uh, D by one by D by one matrix, because it needs to be defined. It needs to solve some D plus one by D plus one system in some upper half space. You go up a dimension. Um, so, so, you know, there's a dimensional mismatch that one needs to take into account. Um, but, but nevertheless, what, what we end up with is, 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 you know, we end up with the equivalence of the, of the semi-norms that we, that we want. Um, what we're able to do is we're able to write, um, we're able to control uh, the LP norm of the, of the T derivatives of the Poisson kernel by the new Poisson type kernel, um, which somehow takes into account the projected difference quotient. Um, and so, um, um, so, so the thing is, is that is that you're we're comparing LP norms of 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 derivative of t derivatives of these things, and we're able to get this uh, pointwise in in t. So the idea is, uh, you have you have the Poisson kernel here, and then you have v here, and so you really what this is about is 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 whether or not is is, is linear combinations of different derivatives, um, and and. Uh, uh, and, and the easiest way to get a hold of, of, of these types of, of LP estimates is to use, uh, you know, homogenized derivatives. That is, that is Reese transforms. Um, and so that's actually what we can do. We can show that the components of the original Poisson kernel, that is, the components of the function that's harmonic, are linear combinations of Reese transforms of the components of the function that is. Uh, that is uh, uh, caloric in the upper half space with respect to an elasticity operator, um, and so so we can use the Reese transforms, um, and and this is this is something that can be done easily for smooth functions that are that are compactly supported using the Fourier transform. Um, you, you know the Fourier transform of the Poisson kernel is is, is well known, um, and so what we did was uh, find the Fourier transform of this new matrix valued. Poisson type kernel, uh, and then uh, and then and then notice that indeed you can write this as as linear combinations of Reese transforms of this, um, and so that was sort of the the, the moral of the moral of the story. Um, so so um, and so once it's done for for compactly supported functions, um, you, you can you can you can use a density argument on the on the on the free space side, and so. So, so this proves uh, this proves this first inclusion. Let me go back briefly. So, so the inclusion that we've proven is this. In other words, we've you know when you replace little p of t with script p, we now have we have now have the inclusion that we want. Um, and so, so I, I should remark uh, uh, the classical uh, corn inequality where you control the gradient by the symmetric part of the gradient. Um, is done using the Reese transforms. And so what we've done is we've gotten a hold of classical derivatives that we can somehow uh, get a hold of the Reese transforms of. So, so the proof technique is essentially the same as it is in the local case, except you go the long way around the square. You use this weird characterization of the Poisson integrals. Um, okay, and then the other inclusion I'll, I'll say less about um, um, that follows uh, that follows in exactly a similar way that that um, the corresponding inequality for for scalars for scalars does, um, and so so in this case, I mean, because you have this matrix valued kernel, this allows you to get the um, uh, the the projected difference quotient um, um, because because the exact form of that of that Poisson type integral gives you uh, the scalar product of u 
and then the, the vector x minus y over, over x minus y. Um, okay, but with those two inclusions, the, uh, uh, the inequality is, is proved. Um, and so, so again, the, so, so, so this is, this is good because we have a, a, you know, not just this characterization of, of the fractional subway space, but also uh, a characterization using, uh, using a new sort of approximation of the identity, a new Poisson type integral. Um, um, not a harmonic extension, but, but some other kind of caloric extension. Um, and, and, and this also gives us uh, uh, sublet inequalities and embedding results for uh, for functions in 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 XFP. So, in other words, uh, you know, yeah, sublet embedding, sublet inequality. That the calculus that you get for for WSP now holds for, for this as well, um, which is which is very useful for, for example for proving proving things like like regularity and. Uh, um, and, 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 and if you want to try to, you know, and, and it's sort of, you know, with an eye towards composition of, of, of non-local operators in the future. Um, so, so I do want to say uh, this characterization is, is not clear for P equals one or P equals infinity. So the classical Korn's inequality does not hold in either case. So P equals infinity, uh, it's sort of obviously, uh, uh, you know, it, you wouldn't really expect it to be true. Like, why would you know uniform estimates of linear combinations of the symmetric prime gradient, you know, control the gradient? Um, so, so it, it's sort of easier to see in, in that case. Um, but for p equals one, it's it's also not true. Um, there are there are, you know there are examples of of, of functions that sort of have high, uh, highly oscillatory behavior um, that you know where where the you know, the symmetric part of the gradient will be integrable, but then the function fails to be in W11. Um, so, so, uh, so, so it's not, so in the, in the non-local case, it's also not clear for us. Um, you know, it's, it's not clear to what extent this, this would hold. Um, yeah. Um, and so, uh, so, so I should also say, um, you know, It'd be nice to somehow view this as a relaxation of the local corns inequality. So, so it's sort of known that you know multiplying by uh, you know the right constant WSP approaches W1P. Uh, you know, as long as you can multiply by the by the, by the right constant. Um, but but this inequality, the uh, the exact nature of, of the constant C uh, means that that can't happen. So as S goes to one, you don't recover. Uh, the, the the local inequality. Um, whether or not that's a, it, it's likely that that is an issue uh, with the proof. There may be a better constant, an optimal constant for which you can see uh, sort of the asymptotic behavior of the inequality converging, uh, uh, approaching the local case. Um, but as of right now, that's you know nothing about that is known. Um, let's see. So, so um, the characterization does does also remain true for for Bessoff spaces. Um, so, so the Bessoff space BSPQ because it has a sort of similar uh, uh, statement. Um, so long as is I think so. So Q so Q I think can be equal to one, but not equal to uh, to infinity. Um, and and so I mean you can you can write a lot of these same statements that way, but well, that would sort of be. Um, that would clutter up a lot of the slides. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, so that's those are just a, a few things. So, okay. So, so let me say a little bit also about about what happens for for bounded domains, um, and and also what happens in the in the classical case for bounded domains, and then uh, uh, we'll finish with an with an application. <clears throat> okay. So, if if omega is a is a bounded domain. Um, now all of a sudden you have, uh, you know, you have to, you know, things are not on the entire space. You don't sort of have behavior at infinity. Um, you need to somehow, um, you know, look at look at the the right collection of functions. Um, and so it's 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 you know, we 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 proved that uh, uh, the XSP semi-norm is equal to zero if and only if U is an affine skew symmetric map or an infinitesimal rigid motion. Um, and so, 
the thing is, is that the WSP seminorm is equal to zero if and only if u is constant. So the zero set of this seminorm is larger than the zero set of the Gagliardo, the WSP seminorm. So, uh, so, so that has to be, you know, taken into into consideration um, when when trying to find a similar type of, of inequality, because in one case, yeah, one side will be, you know, the, the same inequality. Um, you know, this side will be zero when this side isn't. So, so, it, you know, a different type of inequality needs to be sought sought after. Um, and so, uh, what we were able to do. Uh, is 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 prove a similar inequality for for a restricted class of functions. So um, here we have defined uh, the you know for these two spaces um, the closure of, of smooth of C infinity functions with compact support. So this is these are the this is the analog of W one P zero um, both for the classical subleft space and then this 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 new uh, you know sort of symmetric subleft space. Um, and so, so what we're able to prove um, is that uh, between is is that uh, we have this inequality where you can control the Gagliardo seminorm on omega by uh, the projected difference quotient seminorm plus the LP norm of u, uh, so long as u is in uh, is in this uh, you know sort of the the homogeneous the homogeneous space or the, or the, the the, the the analog of H10 or uh, W1P0. Um, there's also uh, a caveat here that that um, SP is is not equal to one. I'll, I'll talk about why that is in in a second. Um, but otherwise, we have the, the same range for for S and for S and for P. Um, and so uh, so this was done. Um, uh, so, so, so this is this is this is now on on the archive as as of a few months ago. Um, and so, so the main tool that we use here is we appeal to the case of of, of R D um, and and use and, and use a uh, an extension operator. Um, so, so this is an operator that that uh, is linear, it's defined on uh, on the on the space of omega. Um, you know, for for functions that that you know for for a suitable class of functions, you know that, that vanish on the boundary um, into into all of R D. Um, and so this is and so so if you use this this boundary extension operator, then you can use the result for for all of R D. Right? You have the uh, WSP norm of omega bounded by the extension, um, and then uh, then you use the the corn type inequality on all of R D. Um, and then you use the the bounded nature of the of the extension, and so again, uh, uh, so so the estimates. So when I write this, this is not quite right. When I write in, intersect C infinity functions with compact support, so this norm is all that appears here. There's nothing about derivatives of U that appear here. However, the inequality uh, we were only able to prove for functions that that vanish on the boundary. Um, that is for for X S P zero. Um, we were not able to for, for the for a general uh, for a general class for the for the, for the whole whole case um, and so so this extension operator is defined through reflections um, much the same way you would define you know a, a Sobolev extension operator except of course we're dealing with vector fields and we're also dealing with this projected difference quotient so everything's you know strong you know everything's coupled together um, you know every component of U appears in that in that dot product. So, so the extension has to be defined uh, so that so that the reflections, uh, uh, you know, you end up with different reflections on on on, on distinct components of you, um, as well as uh, uh, you know different. So so the, the 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 linear combination is 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 different um, depending on which component of you that you're looking at. I didn't write the 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 details here, but. Just be, I didn't write the explicit extension here because it would be, you know, it's it's just sort of uh, uh, not really informative to, to look at. It looks, but it looks like uh, uh, the reflection extension operators for subleft spaces. Um, and so what we were able to do is is that extension operator um, gives you uh, almost the inequality that you want. In other words, uh, uh, you know, for for a gen, so for a general uh, U in just XSP. It gives you almost what you want, except 
uh, it'll give you the XSP norm plus uh, some sort of measure of U, uh, uh, you know, divided by some power of the distance to the boundary. Um, and so after, uh, uh, you know, so, so of course, I mean, like as, as with all of these extension ar arguments, you use a partition of unity, you uh, use that the boundary is compact, you sort of translate and rotate things so that you end up in the case of a, of a half space uh, or, or where U is, 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 is compactly supported on the half space, but may not be compactly supported up to the boundary. Um, and so, so um, what you have is, is, is then you have to control, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, 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 the ratio of U to its distance to the boundary. Um, and so uh, we appeal to a result by my, my advisor, Tadella Mengesha, proved uh, about three years ago, um, where he proves a, a, a hardy type inequality. Um, so, so fractional hardy inequalities are, are known, um, but, uh, but, but, but with the Gagliardo seminorm on the right-hand side, not this. Um, and of course, I forgot a constant, but, um, um, but what he was able to prove was, was uh, the same inequality, but with, with the projected difference quotient on, on, on this side. Um, and so, so with that, with this Hardy inequality, plus the extension operator, plus the extension operator, allows us to uh, uh, to prove the the uh, the corn type inequality um, for functions that vanish on the boundary for C1 domains. Um, and so, so and so once again, what you end up with are, are sublevin Bayes theorems for for the you know. The, the fractional analogs of like W1 P0, except, except in this, you know, in the case of the projected difference quotient, so long as, as omega is, is C1. Okay. Okay, so 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 basically the 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 state of the art right now is is if omega is all of RD or uh, a C1 domain or or a graph domain, um, um sorry, a bounded Z1 domain or a graph domain, we are able to prove this uh, corn type uh, inequality. Okay, so so that's where we're at, and so um, and we're able to prove this corn type inequality for functions that vanish on the boundary. So so the analog in the local case would be there's so classic there is there's the classical corn inequality that says the same thing for all functions u in w one p zero of omega, um, and so that's that's the thing we have here, um, and that is. That is enough to prove uh, to prove different state different qualitative statements about um, about uh, minimization problems. So I know in the abstract I said variational problems, but well, it's minimization problems. So here's here's the statement. Here's the this is the application. Um, so suppose you have a domain that's that's C one, and uh, suppose you take functions u. That vanish in some neighborhood of the boundary of omega. So think of you know think of omega as being a blob, and then you take a you know a, a ring, sort of a ring a, a ring on the outside of that domain, and then you say that u is equal to, to zero there. Um, so so I mean this is this is what's known as a volume constraint problem uh, rather than a boundary value problem. But the reason we're prescribing what u should be. On the boundary of a set, uh, or sorry, on on a on a set of non-zero measure instead of the boundary is because we have non-local uh, energies. So so with the non-local energy, there isn't a local characterization uh, of of the functions, or or it's it's harder to do. Um, and so 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 in in paradynamics, um, people consider these these constraint problems where they prescribe you on a set of non-zero measure. Um, and so the energy. Uh, that we have here is is uh, uh, is the same type of energy, but now with a coefficient um, plus Poisson data, and so we're considering minimizing over the non-local vector-valued analog of like W one P zero of this energy, um, and and so we consider uh, uh, the coefficient a um, to be symmetric in x and y, and 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 then bounded. From above and below. So, so this is a non-local analog of an ellipticity condition, and then this is an, an L infinity condition on the coefficient. Um, and so we only assume that, that A is measurable. So there's no smoothness in, in X and Y on this problem. 
Okay, and so so our goal is to is to find is to find such a uh, such a minimum um, in in this energy space. All right, and so so um, we're able to to do that, and moreover, we're able to say uh, that it's actually function in, in the fractional sublift space. Um, and and thanks to uh, so okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So so if omega is is a bounded domain, uh, and we consider um, PNS in the same range not equal to one so that our corn inequality will hold, then there exists a unique function, uh, there, and then there exists a unique minimizer of this problem. And um, thanks to our corn inequality, we know that this function, so, so this is a function that vanishes close to the boundary, so it can be approximated by C infinity functions with compact support, so it belongs to WSP. Um, and so, so we know that actually uh, we're finding a fractional sublift function. Uh, sublift function. So, in other words, you could replace this energy space with minimizing overall WSP functions that vanish near the boundary, and you'd have the same uh, you'd have the same the same result. Um, oops. So, uh, moreover, what we're able to do, actually, thanks to the corn inequality, is we're able to prove an a priori uh, regularity estimate. Um, so, if if u is equal, so so if u additionally belongs to C1, if that happened, then what we can say is that u actually uh, belongs to a uh, fractional subtle space of higher integrability and higher differentiability with appropriate energy estimates. Right, um, and, and, and also what I should say, if, if p is equal to two, um, then, um, then we don't need to to assume that U is C one at all. Um, this this uh, sublift of regularity will hold automatically for for any minimizer of this of this problem. Um, and so 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 I so I should say the the so the, so we get regularity um, so long as 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 f is smooth enough for for any uh, sort of sort of measurable coefficients a. Um, and I should say that this is sort of the first the, sort of the 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 sort of beginning regularity results uh, for for the system of linear elasticity in, in the sense of, of, of Myers. Um, so in the local case, if you have a sublet function w12 that minimizes this energy, um, where the coefficients are measurable and and f uh, and f is smooth enough, let's say l2, then you know automatically that u is in w1p for any uh, for any positive p. Uh, so sorry for some p bigger than two um so so hmm, i feel like i maybe this should go the other way yeah, something i've written something strange here <laughs> anyway uh, but the point is is that automatically you get additional integrability of the gradient of u if you're a minimizer or more generally a weak solution um and so in this non-local case something similar happens um but because we're in this fractional sublet regime wsp there's the additional uh, the additional um, um, uh, phenomenon that you increase in differentiability as, as well, um, and so this is this is a, a phenomenon that's 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 known uh, in the non-local case. Um, it, you know, for example, if you if you look at, at solutions to to the fractional Laplacian or or, or, or those types of energies, um, this is something that's that's uh, that's observed, um, and so so we see the same thing here in the in the context of this continuum mechanics problem or the problem motivated by continuum mechanics. So, so um, I should say existence and uniqueness, our energy is, 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 is convex. And now, I mean, we have coercivity even in WSP. Um, so, so that follows by direct methods. Um, and so the thing is, is that the fractional corn type inequality, um, okay, that should be omega, but uh, it gives, it gives sublev, a sublev embedding result um, for, uh, for, for excess P zero. And so what that means is, is uh, you know, using that sublet embedding, um, we obtain, you know, so starting with a Cacciapoli type estimate for, for minimizers, you can uh, then use sublet embedding to obtain a reverse holder inequality. Um, and then that reverse holder inequality um, um, gives you, uh, um, um, you know, it gives you some additional regularity. Um, so in the case of, of so, so, so um, what Armin did in, in 2015 was, was prove a sort of a priori estimate using, using a, a, com, a commutator estimate. And thanks to the fractional corn type inequality, we're able to obtain a, a similar, 
a similar commutator estimate on 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 some sort of you know com, uh, combination of, of, of sort of fractional derivatives. Um, but the but the result is 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 very is very similar, and thanks to the corn type inequality, we have we have sort of the same calculus of spaces. So um, you know, for the sake of, of you know not repeating his work here because it's almost exactly the same, um, we're able to get the uh, a similar a priori estimate that he got um, uh, for for these smooth solutions. Um, and so uh, I should say there's there's sort of another approach to obtain higher integrability of of, uh, of of functions uh, of solutions to uh, to, uh, um, to to fractional integral differential equations um, by by Pascal Osher and and and, uh, um, and his his collaborators. So if p is equal to two, um, this a priori estimate can be can be strengthened to a genuine self improving inequality. In other words, uh, you know if p is is equal to two here instead of just a general p, um, you can say that that uh, there's a there's a constant there's a you get this um, you get this for free you don't need to assume additionally that you use this so so that's so so it's there's an existence and uniqueness result and then sort of an regular and then a regularity uh, result which which we're able to use uh, with the corn inequality um, so so um, so yeah I'll um, I'll let people ask uh, questions um, so thanks very much for your attention. Yeah, Jimmy, thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk. Um, and now there's room for questions. <laughs>